How we doing? Come on, come on, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, wherever you're at, tuned in. We're so glad you're joining us in this effort to change the world for the name and the fame of Jesus Christ. And I want to ask you this question up front today. Why would you buy anything without trying it first? Especially in this day and age, right? You can try something before you financially commit to it. And this isn't even really advice. Like, this is just the air we breathe. Like, this is what we do, okay? Companies are capitalizing on this idea that you can try before you buy, right? Warby Parker, if you want some glasses, you can reach out to them. They'll send you five pair to try out. You can see what you look like in them. You can keep the one you want. You can send the rest back, okay? This is not unique to them. Grocery stores are picking up on this. You can go in. You don't have to deliberate over which hummus you're going to get this time. And you don't, you know, how does it taste? Because I can't taste through the container. At Whole Foods, you can actually go to them. I read this and ask them, hey, can I try this product out? Can I sample it? There's some rules around it, but you can try before you buy in grocery stores, right? There's a mattress company out there that says, you know, it's not just this guarantee. It's not like, hey, buy it, test it out. You can uh, return it. But Novus Bed says they will give you a mattress without you purchasing it for 120 days. And then after 120 days, you can return it or you can buy it from them or you can exchange it for a different one. There's a company out there with appliances, Perch. You can go into their showroom. You can take your dirty clothes with you or some dirty dishes. You can try out a dishwashing machine. You can try out a washing machine, a dryer. You can try out their appliances before you purchase them. Here's some advice. Before you financially commit to anything, especially if it's a big purchase, I would personally encourage you to try it out. The biggest one out there is, is you know, that we talk about a lot is a car. You can test drive a car. Why wouldn't you test drive a car before you make a purchase that big? I, uh, I was interested in a car once, several times, but on this one particular occasion, I saw a car it was a great deal. It was on Craigslist. I reached out to the individual, and, he, and as I was talking to him on the phone, he was so excited. He said, hey, you've got to drive it. If you drive this car, you're going to buy it. I knew the price was right. I saw that it was you know, cheaper than than others on there. And so uh, he said, man, I just got to get you behind the wheel of this car. I said, okay. He was so eager that he actually showed up here. This was years ago. I just started working at Watermark and he shows up with the car. I I get in, I'm driving it down Park Central, this curvy road here. It had the uh, Triptronic shifter, you know, it can shift on the steering wheel. It handled well. It It was a really comfortable, fast, fun car. The price was right. And I bought it. And I loved it. I enjoyed that car for about a month. About a month into it, my wife calls me. She says, uh, there's a police officer here. The Department of Motor Vehicles has sent over a police officer, and they are asking me about your car. I thought, oh, no. I got, I, was, I remember I was sitting at my desk. I got in the car. I, I drove over there as quickly as I could. I got there. They said, uh, sir, do you own this vehicle? I said, yes, I do. They said, not anymore. It's stolen. I said, it can't be stolen. I said, the guy had the, the title and, and an ID and everything. It was, it was, it's a fake ID. Uh, he purchased the car under false pretense with a, a fake cashier's check. It was not his vehicle to sell you. It's a stolen car. And they left with my vehicle on the back of a tow truck. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars down the toilet. Which is what brings me what I want to talk to you about this evening is the reality of it that was not his to sell me and so as we talk about this idea of trying before you buy as it relates to sex or as it relates to your body that's the problem with the advice it ain't yours it's not yours to give away it was entrusted to you by God for a purpose 
And if you do anything with that body that he loaned to you outside of his purpose, it's abuse. It's abuse. And so this is the problem with this advice that's not even advice. It's just the world we live in. Nobody's telling you this. They just expect it of you. It's like we have this neighbor family. You see this couple. They've got their act together. They're clean cut, straight laced. Your friends kind of make fun of them because they never really go and get drunk and they're not wild and they're just kind of, you know, like this, this really straight laced family. But as you look into it, you realize they seems like they have a really healthy marriage, like they love each other, like they really enjoy each other. And they're pulling you aside and they, 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 they start their day in God's word and they pray before meals and it just seems like they love God and they go to church together and they pull you aside and they say, yeah, you know, you really should pursue purity and you blow it off as old fashioned advice. But then you've got this crazy uncle. He's been married three times. You know, he loves the party. He's got a stack of, of porn magazines on the coffee table. And he pulls you aside and he's like, hey, listen, you want to try before you buy. And for some reason, we take advice from the crazy uncle. It's bad advice. Why do we do it? We're in this series called Bad Advice. Tonight we're talking about this idea of trying before you buy as it relates to sex. It's also like, hey, it's, it's just sex is what they might say. Or, hey, wait until you're ready. What does that even mean? I've been ready since the fifth grade. I mean, who's not ready to have sex, right? And so I was talking to this guy who has this marriage that I really respect, kind of like that neighbor I talked about a moment ago. He said he's one of the most godly men I know, one of the most God-fearing men I know. He travels and talks about marriage. His marriage is that healthy. He loves God. He loves Jesus. And we were talking once, and he just said, you know, JP, you and I talk about sex very differently. And I said, well, what do you mean? I'm listening because this is a man I really respect. And he says, I just like sex. I haven't, he said this, he goes, I haven't had sex with my wife in 17 years. And I thought, oh no. Can I, can I pray for you? I don't know what to do. <laughs> and then he goes on, I realize I misunderstood him. Then he goes on to say, sex is what dogs do on the side of the road. He said the intimacy that we experience, the closeness and the oneness that happens when we do that act that God created, that he gifted to us, I can't even call it what the world calls it. See, some of you, your biggest fear tonight is that you'll never have sex. That's not your biggest fear. That shouldn't be your biggest fear. Your biggest fear should be that you might only have sex. That that might all, that might be the only thing you have and you never experience the deeper intimacy that God has designed us for between two people when they come together in a place where there's no shame and it's holy and it's spiritual and it's deep and it's meaningful and it's gentle and it's kind and it's loving and it's patient and it's amazing. And that's what I want for you. So listen up. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. I'm going to show you some stats real quick that will kind of tell you from the world that this is bad advice. The divorce rate, as you know, is around 50%. It hovers there. Um, couples, though, however, when they get married and they're both virgins, that divorce rate of 50% goes down to 9%. Do you think God knows what he's doing? I, I really wish I would have known this. I wish someone would have told me this uh, when I was in my early 20s or coming out of high school or really coming out of junior high, I wish somebody would have told me. If you wait until you're married, just you, just one of the partners, your chances of divorce decrease by 70%. Here's some stats on cohabitation. That really is the nature of try before you buy these days that you would live together. This comes from the U.S. Attorney Legal Services. Couples who live together are 250% more likely to divorce in the first five years of marriage than those who haven't. 90% of couples who live together don't get married. Consider some of you who've lived together and you're no longer with that person. 80% of those that get married end up getting divorced. 
Okay, here's what that means. Those are fast statistics. Let's just say there's 100 people up here. They've all lived together before they were married. We'll take 90 of them and we'll get rid of them. They won't get married. There's 10 left. 80% of those 10 will get divorced. We'll remove eight from those 10. There's two left. Two out of 100 people will have a successful marriage. Does God know what he's doing? How smart is the world? You gonna keep taking advice from the world? Keep taking advice from your crazy uncle. You can have a marriage just like him. His first, second, third. What are we doing? Try before you buy. Paul's going to tackle some bad advice of his day as we move through it. We're going to talk about the purpose of sex, the power of sexual sin, and before you leave here this evening, the price of healing. And so what's going on is he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth. There's over 1,000 temple prostitutes uh, because of the goddess Aphrodite. She has a temple there in Corinth. So you go to church, you can have sex with a prostitute. He's writing into that culture. There's this other phenomenon going on. It's an overcorrection that they say, well, sex is physical and only the spiritual is good. And so sex is bad. So he's trying to address to them that sex is not bad. Sex is good. It's a gift from God, but you shouldn't have it with people that you're not committed to in marriage. And so he writes this in verse 12. I have the right to do anything, in quotes, you say, he says. This is a popular saying of that time. This is bad advice. People are going around, hey man, do whatever feels good. Do whatever you want. Follow your heart. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. He's saying, man, that's bad advice. Choices have consequences. I have the right to do anything, in quotes, but I will not be mastered by anything. There there are things that you do that you can't stop doing. There are things you wanted the freedom to do, but then you don't have the freedom to stop. You get trapped, you get stuck. You say, again, bad advice, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. This is the bad advice of that time. He's writing this. It's it's still bad advice today. He's saying, hey, you eat whatever you're hungry for. You do whatever feels good. You do whatever seems right. Even though the Proverbs say there's a right, there's a way that seems right to a person, but in the end it leads to death. He's saying, hey, there there are things that you eat that will ultimately destroy you. Right? We know this. We've learned this one. When you're little, like you want ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Anybody love ice cream? I love ice cream. Bluebell, I'm all about it. Yeah, okay. But you probably didn't have it today for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You learned that. It's not wise when you're a freshman. You gained 15 pounds. It wasn't wise, right? Like, hey, I'm not going to do that. We, we know that that's not smart. Even though it tastes good. Even though you enjoy it. Hey, I'm not going to do that. My in-laws, <laughs> they love Golden Corral. Pray for them. And... Uh, <laughs> So I've been with them. I gotta say, it's a tremendous value, uh, the Golden Corral. <laughs> and, th- and there's always this fam- family, and I don't mean to be mean or insensitive, but, but there's this family there, and they're, and they're piling up the dessert, and they're clearly unhealthy. They're destroying themselves, and they're going through the buffet line and just heaping it up, getting plates and plates, and it's like, man, you need a friend. You need someone to come alongside you and say, that is destructive. And this is what Paul is saying. No, the, the, it's not, the, the stomach is for food, but not to eat whatever you want to eat whenever you want to eat it. And in the same way, if you say, well, I have an appetite for sex, so I'm just going to pursue release, that is foolish and ignorant and not what that hunger pang is meant to to be satisfied by. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality before the Lord. And the Lord for the body, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. You wanna know if God cares about your body? He cares about it so much he's gonna preserve it and carry it into eternity. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Your body, it belongs to Jesus. Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them? That word unite them is literally glue them, stick them with a prostitute. Never, he writes. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute, this word for prostitute, it it is any person that you would have sex without a marriage. Check me on that. In the Greek, we, we translate it prostitute. 
In, in the earliest translations, hey, this is someone, but it's not someone you would pay for to have sex with. It's someone that you would have sex with that you're not in a covenant relationship with. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. This is design talk, Paul is saying. He's saying, hey, this body, it was given to you, it was designed to you. It was designed by a person. It was designed by a deity. There was, it had a designer. And something is happening that you don't fully understand when you go through this act we call sex. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Paul is going to great lengths to say, hey, there's not a separation from your body and, and what is spiritual. Your body is spiritual. And what you do with your body is spiritual. You can't avoid that. God has a purpose for your body. So before you go doing something with it, you should consult with him. And so my first point today is the purpose of sex. We're going to talk about the purpose of sex, that God is the master designer of sex. And so if you want to understand how to do something, there's a couple ways that you can learn about it. One is you can talk to someone who's done it a lot. But practice doesn't always make perfect, right? If it did, if we, if we thought, hey, you know, the person who's the best at this act is the one who's done it a lot, is we're all, then we're going to be looking for the person who's had the most sex, who's had the most partners. We're going to say, that's who I want is my spouse. But nobody thinks that way. Okay, so then you could talk to someone who's really good at it. But this good at it is also confusing because our culture has dumbed it down to technique. And there are people who claim to be great lovers who have miserable marriages and multiple marriages. So there's got to be something more to this technique. What we do not understand, what we fail to realize as a culture in 2017 is sex is spiritual. That it's a spiritual act. And so why not talk to the one who made it? That's what you can do if you want to learn a lot about something, is you can talk to the one who invented the act. God, he's pro-sex. He's all about it. It was his idea. It was his genius, glorious, amazing idea. Father, son, and spirit. I don't know if they had a whiteboard or what. I imagine they didn't have a whiteboard. They didn't need one. But they're just like, what if we did this and this is how we brought life in? Like, that's a great idea. And we'll make it feel good. It's going to be awesome. How do we do that? Well, we'll make the man like this and a female like this. And this part will fit there. It's genius. Oh, it's going to get so much more awkward than that. So buckle up, okay? <laughs> We're just getting started. Let me just show you that God is pro-sex. I'm going to read to you from the Bible, okay? This is Song of Solomon, chapter 7. Okay, it's a man talking to a woman. Your stature is like that of a palm, and your breasts are like clusters of fruit. I said, I will climb the palm tree and take hold of its fruit. Try not to do things with my hands. May, <laughs> may your breast be like clusters of grapes on the vine, the fragrance of your breath like apples, and your mouth like the best wine. And then she responds, may the wine go straight to my beloved, flowing gently over his lips and teeth. I belong to my beloved and his desires for me. I'll stop right there so you can sleep tonight. But it, it goes on in tremendous detail talking about how incredible it can be between two people who love each other. When they celebrate this gift that God gave us, he's pro-sex, he invented it, he made us for it. He designed us for it. He made the parts, not just the way they work, the way they do, but he also put the nerve endings where he did so that it would feel the way that it does. It was all God's genius plan. It's his design. And so a man has a sexual organ which places a seed inside a woman's sexual organ that fertilizes an egg so that a life is born. How stinking genius is this? That this is how we would cover the earth with God followers. That life would be brought when two people who love Jesus come together and they celebrate this gift from God. Life is brought forth. And children, God says, are a blessing. But we don't always see children as a blessing, do we? Sometimes we see them as an inconvenient. And so God, in his genius ways, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, said, you know what? We better make this act feel good so that they will bring these, this life forth. 
Because if it didn't feel good, like right, if sex felt like a spinal tap, we probably wouldn't have kids, right? And the human, you know, uh, human beings would probably die out. God's genius plan. Do you know the first command that God gave human beings? In Genesis chapter one, verse 28, God made them male and female, and then he says this, have a lot of sex. That's the message version. He said, uh, he said <laughs> be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Have a lot of children. This is my plan for covering the earth with people who love me. I want you to do this act a lot and bring forth life. And so this feeling good, it does something. But God didn't just make the parts the way that he did and made it feel the way that it does. He wired it into then our brains so that Whenever we experience, I need you to hear this, okay? And I need you to tell people, because this is not taught. Whenever we experience that act, and we specifically we experience the climax of that act, or release, or orgasm, what happens is our brain releases dopamine. Dopamine is what makes you feel good. It gives you a euphoric feeling, a sensation. It's the highest levels of dopamine that can naturally be released in a person is through the act of sex and specifically the climax. This is why people will give their lives to it. This is why you felt like something fun has been kept from you, like God's trying to keep something. He's not. There's a design around it. That act, what happens then when you experience that feel-good cessation is your brain creates what's called a synapse. A synapse is like a muscle, almost like a, a memory muscle. What that does is, it, this is important, is it bonds your five senses to your surroundings. And there's all kinds of phenomenons around this. Modern secular psychology calls this phenomenon sex glue. That, that are, there's a person that will get so addicted to pornography, they can't experience an erection without porn there. Because they've glued themselves physiologically to pornography. And so you can imagine, this is why he says in 1 Corinthians 16, the two will become one flesh. He says they literally will become stuck together. And so here's a visual for you. It's going to blow your mind. You're going to be like, whoa. You ready? You ready for this? Two. Become one. Boom. That just happened. Stuck together. Bonded. What happens in that synapse, and this is important. I want you to remember this word standard is whoever you experience sexual release with, they become your standard. This is so genius in the safeness of marriage that as her body changes and his body changes and they age, as they continue to come back together in this act, they become each other's standard. The marriage is safeguarded. Right? Other people can't come into that because they are each other's standard. This is a real phenomenon. It really happens. It happens with that neighbor I was talking about earlier. When they're the only two people that they've experienced, they are each other's standards and it's safe. There's no shame there. No embarrassment. You, you don't have to wonder if he's comparing you to the six other girls or, or she's comparing you to that ex-boyfriend. You don't have to wonder about that. And this phenomenon, this is where those insecurities come from because when we try to pull it apart, it's destructive. It's destructive. And the shame creeps in and the insecurities creep in and the feelings of doubt creep in and the questioning creeps in, and the wondering creeps in, and the marriage and the relationship is no longer safe. This was God's genius design. We've taken it, and we think we know better than the Creator. This is pretty much a picture of my life 12 years ago. Walking around in pieces, not even realizing it, celebrating 
the shame that happened because we've dumbed sex down to technique. We're so worried about the honeymoon that we've traded the 20 year anniversary for a great honeymoon. I, I know a lot of believing couples that don't even have sex on their wedding night. I, I might dare to say that most or close to most don't even have sex on their, on their wedding night. And you say, man, that's great. I never even thought about that. It happened. It's true. Why? He's, he's so gentle and kind and caring and patient. They experience intimacy. And, and maybe not even in that act on their wedding night, but they have the rest of their lives to figure that out. And for them, it just gets better and, and more enjoyable and more worshipful. Some of us will never have that. In fact, if you want to try something before you buy it, that is to inspect it, look for patience. Look for their willingness to wait. Look for their willingness to pursue purity because you know that person is going to do whatever it takes to keep your marriage pure. You know they haven't conditioned themselves to having sex outside of marriage. I would look for that. I would lean in for that. The, look for the, the loving, kind, patient kind of person, the gentle kind of person. And so sex, it's for procreation, and it's for bonding two people together in marriage. It's not for pleasure. God made it pleasurable to accomplish those two other things. God, in his genius, kindness, and grace, made it feel good so that two people would be bonded together and that we would bring forth life. And so what we do now, listen, we try to prevent pregnancy, and we try to prevent the bonding while capturing the pleasure, and we're left with a cheap activity. We're left with a cheap thrill, a cheap thing. That's why he says, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He says, run from sexual sin because it will hurt you in a really unique way. All sin will cost you something. But Paul, the Holy Spirit through Paul says, this one is going to cost you in a unique way. It has a higher cost. Second point, the power of sexual sin. The power of sexual sin. Sexual immorality, that is sex outside of God's design, impacts us emotionally, physiologically, physically, and spiritually. And so consider how difficult it is to heal from sexual abuse. Would everyone here say, it, it's gotta be difficult to heal from sexual abuse? Can I get a head nod on that? It's gotta be difficult to heal. Uh, abuse is defined as misuse. Anything that's done outside of design. So the vast majority of us tonight have endured some sort of sexual abuse. That is sex outside of God's design. That means the vast majority of us tonight are in desperate need of healing. And that's your application for tonight. You have to pursue healing. And then we're going to talk about how. But that's what I want you to leave with. You've got to pursue healing. And so masturbation is a type of sexual abuse, oral sex, sexting, any kind of sex outside of God's design. And so if God created sex to bond us to someone, consider what happens when we bond to multiple people. We train our bodies not to be sticky. We train our brains not to attach to someone. We've, we've taken that and we begin to rewire us. The average millennial has eight sexual partners before marriage. Here's a, a visual aid for you, some Lego people, all right? And so if this is his and this is her sexual partner, and they come together, right? It's not sticky. I know. Your minds are blown right now. You're like, I, uh, this, is, this is what you're going to but, but just think about it. Think about this. You are rewiring yourself when you take that outside of God's design. You're retraining yourself. You're taking that, something that God created to protect you and you're using it in a destructive way. 
Do you remember what I said that whoever experiences, whoever we experience sexual release with, they become our standards? And, and so imagine what happens when we introduce pornography into the picture. 16 clicks of airbrushed perfection into the picture, that that would become our new standard. Imagine the problems that we run into then, right? There is no satisfying a porn addict. There, there, is no, there is no way that you are going to fulfill someone who has gone through a university of training themselves meticulously toward multiple partners in adultery over and over and over. And we may not know each other, so you may be like, man, preacher boy's coming down strong, heavy-handed. That's my story. I speak from experience. I've met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of porn addicts. I've never met anyone as struggled as much as I did. Not because I think I'm terminally unique. I just know how sick and depraved my mind was before Jesus Christ. And when I was introduced to this at an early age, I tasted something that was good. And then I had the freedom of the internet in my own house. And I could go through click after click after click of perversion slowly and meticulously rewiring my brain so that when I got married, there is no possible earthly way that any human being, woman, was going to satisfy me. And so I spent the past decade in recovery so that I can love her in a way that honors God and honor God with my body as the scripture commands. And it wasn't just the pornography, but it was relationship after sexual relationship after sexual relationship. But there's healing. That's what I want you to know. There's healing. You're not left hopeless. The only person who won't find hope is the one who leaves here and doesn't look for it. God wants to restore you. He wants to help you. I thought I would struggle with pornography until I was married. The struggle became the most difficult to manage after marriage as a believer. It felt like Jesus wasn't working. I'm like, like a dog to his vomit. I'm running back to these things that are slowly destroying me. And I'm like, Jesus, I thought you were going to save me. I thought you were going to help me. Like I thought I'd come to you and you clean up my life. And I didn't realize that my sin had consequences that I had to sit in, that I had to heal from. It took time, right? And, and so, yes, those wounds will heal, but you'll be left with scars, at least until you get that renewed body that glorified body. I don't want to misrepresent anything to you tonight. I cannot remove all of the consequences of your sin here on this earth. There will be consequences to your choices, but they will be prolonged if you leave here and you do not pursue healing. Jesus can heal your wounds. I, I, you know, all kinds of wounds. There, one in four of you tonight has an STD. One in four. A lot of you don't even know it, and I can't make those go away. Some of you have had abortions. I cannot undo that. I can, I can point you to the grace of God, and I can show you how to take that mess and make it a message and help heal others and, and have God turn it into a ministry, but I can't undo that. I can't erase those images, the hundreds of images you've slowly fed your heart through your brain, through your eyes. I can't make them go away. I can't make you a virgin again, and I wouldn't trust anyone who says they can. That's crazy. But I can give you hope. But I can give you hope. And the best thing for being a really great lover isn't practice, it's purity. The best thing to become a really great lover is not more practice, it's purity. And someone recently asked me if I ever thought about other women when I was with my wife, Monica, and I thought about that. 
and my answer like surprised me in a really delightful way, the best kind of way. I, I just said two wonderful words. I said, not anymore. Not anymore. I know I used to have a Rolodex that my brain would spin through. I'm ashamed to tell you, man. Ashamed to tell you. But 12 years of pursuing Christ, pursuing intimacy with him, I, I, I listen, I've had all kinds of sex. But I've never experienced anything as beautiful and as spiritual and as worshipful as, as what I have today, and it just gets better and better and better, and I'm not selling you a bill of goods. I'm telling you the truth. There is hope for you, but it starts with you pursuing healing. Why would you wait, man? Verse 19, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. I want everyone to look down at their body right now, at your own body, not your neighbor's body. Look down at your own body, okay? You, you two, Fort Worth and Houston, everybody look down at your body. You know, th that's not yours. It doesn't belong to you. You have it on loan. Okay, you don't have to be happy with it or, or critical of it or, or anything. It's not yours. Okay, God gave it to you and he gave it to you for a really specific reason that you would honor him with it, that you would glorify him in what you do with it. It belongs to him. And so I want to talk about the price of healing before we leave here. Let's talk about the price of healing. So you have this body on loan, right? You would never loan something to someone else that was lent to you. Like if you have something that doesn't belong to you and somebody sees it, hey, can I borrow that? that you know, nail polish or your car, and you're like, no, it's not mine to give to you. And that's the, what I, the mindset I want you to think before you give this to someone else or let someone else do anything with it. They need to consult the owner. That is God. Sex, it's an act of worship to him, and that's why the enemy is going after it. He hates you. He hates when people worship God. And so he wants to take this act of worship and dumb it down to a momentary pursuit of fleeting pleasure. And so he's after sex and he's trying to destroy it and redefine it and make it something that it was never meant to be. And so why not try before you buy? Because you're not buying anything. You're not a product. You are a human being. You belong to God and you've been purchased by Jesus Christ and your body, it belongs to him. And so if someone wants to do something with it, have them ask him if they can. Can you think of a greater buzzkill? Hanging out, you know, hey, you want to go back to your bedroom? I don't know. Why don't we ask Jesus? watching this movie, you want to lay down? Eh, let's pray about that for an hour. <laughs> right? The price that God paid for your body is Jesus, his son. The price that you pay for healing is purity and pursuing Jesus with everything you have. Verse 20, therefore, honor God with your body. Listen, friends, if you feel like damaged goods right now, and I know a lot of you do, I'm so sorry, I know so many of you. You feel the condemnation, you feel the weight, the enemy, it's the lies he whispers. Man, I know, I know. Talk to so many of you, I know you feel it. If you feel like damaged, if you feel like you're ruined right now, I want you to know something. You're in really good company. We're all damaged goods. We've all been ruined by sin. That, those are the people that Jesus comes and, and he purchases, and he pays for our sins. That's the gospel, that all of your sins went on Christ, that you don't have to pay for your sins in eternity because Jesus did. And you have the same inheritance as the spotless virgin, the lamb, the spotless lamb, the, the sinless savior. You have the same inheritance as him through the gospel. By trusting in Christ, his death and resurrection, and he delights in forgiving you no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of sexual abuse you've encountered, whether you've been abused or the abuser, 
He delights in restoring you. He delights in taking your mess and making it a message that you might use it to set others free. He purchased us misfits to be his brothers and sisters in his kingdom. Your body, it belongs to him. And the goal this evening is not that you would simply not have sex. The goal is that you would honor him in everything you do with your body. And you're going to need help. And so we're here to help you. I want you to come in here this Monday. There'll be over a thousand people in this room this Monday night at 6.30. It's a ministry we call Regeneration. And you know that as I've talked about porn, you've felt uncomfortably because you know last night or last week or last month, you went back to that website and you know the website, you know the app, you've been there, you've seen it, you've watched the videos, the clips, you looked at the pictures, you know the kind of pornography that you like, you know your preference. And I'm talking to you, you need help. I've been there, you need help. And it's not, you're not gonna find restoration without pursuing help. And so you show up this Monday night at 6.30, you prioritize it. If you have plans, I'd cancel them. I would come in this room this Monday at 6.30. And some of you, you need to mark your calendar six to 12 months out, go in your Microsoft Outlook, and six to 12 months, you write, date again. And between now and then, you begin to incorporate a healthy study of God's word, a getting to know him, a daily prayer, community around you, belonging to a church, joining a church, becoming a member. Remake your life in those six to 12 months. Make Christ your greatest pursuit, that you would be stuck to him, that you would be united to him. Some of you, you need to confess your sexual sins. You need to do that tonight before you leave. You need to find someone with a black shirt on that says the porch Dallas. You need to go up to him and say, man, I gotta talk to you. You say, I gotta talk to you. They're gonna know what that means. And you, you just say, hey, I need help. Here's what's going on. Here's what I've done. Here's what I'm in the middle of. And it's gonna take a lot of courage. It's gonna take some crazy courage. I, you're gonna feel like you can't utter those words. Listen, I just told thousands of you some of my junk and I pray that that emboldens you to do the same, that you would go up to someone and say, hey, I need help. Others of you, you need to break up. You break up, get well, get back together. Don't try to do it together. Take some time apart. Say, hey, we need, we need to pursue Jesus. I pray you do it before you leave the parking lot tonight. If it's a long distance relationship, call them and say, hey, I've got a date with Jesus. I need to, I need to push pause on this for a little while. And it's what you need. I'm not trying to make it awkward for you right now. I know it is. I love you. I want God's best for you. I want better than what you have for you. It's my only motive. God is not trying to rip you off. He wants to give you life so that you might have it abundantly. And that's what I want to do as I read his word over you. It's interesting that um, when they left with my car, I, uh, you know, I scrambled. I mean, I was out thousands of dollars and um, talked to an attorney friend. They said, hey, you can go to court and try to fight for it. So I did. I went to court and showed up and the judge says, hey, it's not your car. Couldn't argue with that. <laughs> Even though I had paid for it, it belonged to somebody else. I said, okay. I left with my head hanging low and uh, the insurance company called me. And I had insured it immediately upon purchase. And they said, hey, we're going to declare it a total loss. We're going to cover it. Which I had never expected because I was just like, man, this is my foolishness. Like, this was my stupidity. Like, this was my mistake. I said, we'll cover it. That's what happened at the cross. Not that Christ is an insurance policy. He's not. And, and not that I would then go around, oh, wow, insurance is going to cover this. I'm just going to go around buying stolen cars then. You know, that would be stupid. No, I thanked God for grace. I thanked him that he was no longer counting that sin against me, that I didn't have to pay for it any further with him. And I moved on and I was committed to being wiser. I was committed to doing things his way. That's what I want you to leave here with. Receive grace. You don't need to leave with shame. Shame is the voice of the enemy. Guilt is his language. That's what he speaks. Tell him right now, hey, shh. Receive grace. I've been an idiot. I've done some stupid things. I 
played with things that didn't belong to me. I looked at things that didn't belong to me. I gave myself to things that were not mine. God, I abused your daughters. God, I abused your sons. Thank you for grace. Now would you restore me? Give me courage to pursue healing. That's what I want for you. Do you not know your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You've been bought by a price. Do you know, Jesus, why not try before you buy? Jesus didn't. He didn't. He just committed. He just committed. He just committed. He just purchased you, man. Gave his life to purchase you, bought you, set you free, gave you eternity with him in his kingdom, set you up an inheritance with him forever and ever and ever in glory, no longer counting your sins against you. It is to his delight that he forgives you. Walk in that, man. Would you walk in that and be free? That's what I want you. I want you to leave your junk in this room. You leave your junk in this room, you walk out those doors and you be free and be new and stop. Be set apart. Don't do things the world's ways. Your crazy uncle is crazy. Okay? God has something better for you. Father, would you show us that you have something better for us? Thank you for this amazing text. Thank you for the freedom that you offer us. Thank you for forgiveness. The reality that your son paid it all that he paid it all there's nothing left for us to pay for the bill's been taken care of help us to find that restoration that regeneration that newness of life in the name of your son Jesus Christ amen